All right. Now, last week, I introduced the letter of 1 John. As I said, I want to recap some of that. We saw that it's written by the Apostle John, probably from Ephesus. And if that's correct, and it was probably sent to churches somewhere in that region, perhaps including the territory of the churches in, uh, that we see mentioned in Revelation chapter 2 and 3. And the letter, 1 John, was written in response to a crisis in the church caused by the rise and influence of certain false teachers who had come from within the church. They'd started out as orthodox believers, but then they went beyond apostolic doctrine into heresy. And in doing that, they wound up negating some of the truths of the apostolic doctrine. And by the time of 1 John, these false teachers had separated themselves or had seceded from the faithful Christians, these churches that were abiding in the truth of John's gospel. So here they are, they're coming from within the church. They advance beyond apostolic doctrine into heresy. They then see themselves as the true enlightened and they secede or withdraw from the faithful churches and they show those churches, those Christians who are abiding in the apostolic doctrine, they show little, if any, brotherly love toward them. Now, some of these false teachers, though they had seceded or withdrawn from, those, from the faithful churches, some of them are still circulating around, traveling to the churches, and they're trying to re recruit Christians to their heretical teaching. And this was apparently making some of the faithful insecure about their salvation, worried that they may have missed the boat. And you see how that works. I mean, somebody comes along and says, we're really enlightened and we have the real idea and the real understanding. They make you question, do I really understand? Do I really have the truth or are these people right? And so should I be concerned? So they were causing some of that. So John writes to instruct, warn, and encourage the faithful. Now, the errors of these false teachers, I went into some detail on this last week, the errors of these false teachers seem to be in two main areas. One is the nature of Christ, which we refer to as Christology, the study of the nature of Christ. One was they had Christological errors, errors dealing with the nature of Christ, and they had errors dealing with Christian behavior, ethics. So we have these two poles seem to be where the errors they revolve around these things. Regarding the nature of Christ, <clears throat> the false teachers, in some sense, they denied the incarnation. They denied that the eternal Christ, the Son of God, actually became flesh. They had their ways of dealing with this, like, you know, that, that well, no, he only seemed to be flesh. But they denied, in some sense, the incarnation that the divine, the eternal Son, actually became flesh, became a human being. And they also marginalized the significance of the man, Jesus. And I'll talk about the reasons for that in a second. Regarding Christian behavior, they were morally indifferent. They didn't seem to care how a person conducted themselves in this mortal body, while at the same time, they claimed to be sinless. Okay, I went into that and talked about that last week, and I suggested to you that this mix of errors was rooted in the same kind of ideas that gave rise to full-blown Gnosticism in the second century. That's when Gnosticism really develops. But we're not in the second century yet. But you see the same kind of ideas. And, and I suggested to you this mix of errors came from those kinds of ideas. Specifically, it seems to be rooted in a kind of radical dualism, a radical distinction between matter and spirit. You see, the idea that, that the spiritual, the non-material, that that was divine and that was good and that the material was created and evil. And so that radical dualism, that idea, that would not only create resistance to the incarnation, it would create resistance to the idea that you could have a genuine, lasting union between the divine, spiritual, the good, and the created evil matter. So that create caused them to come up with some other ways of saying, no, it couldn't be that. So that idea, that radical distinction between matter and spirit, 
not only would create resistance to the incarnation, it easily could lead to devaluing the life and the death of, the, of Jesus of human flesh. Like, how can that be important? Because this is meaningless. All that matters is the spiritual and enlightenment, so this doesn't really count for anything. And you see this continue to pop up, by the way. You see uh, aspects of this in modern Christian thinking. Also, you had if liberation of the spirit through knowledge, if that's the important thing. See, that we're, we're spirits trapped in this evil material existence, but we are really this inner divine spark. If, if what's important is the liberation of the spirit through knowledge, that's the only important thing. And if matter itself is evil, well, then it's not a great leap to the view that, that how one behaves while in this evil material state, especially after the liberation of one's spirit through enlightenment, through knowledge, well, that it's spiritually trivial or irrelevant. It doesn't matter. Who cares about how you conduct yourself here? And that would explain how these false teachers, they could be morally indifferent, but also claim to be sinless because they had a different definition of sin. They didn't care what you did with your body. And I gave you some quotes uh, ended with, I think, Burge's quote about second century Gnosticism where you saw that. All right, so that's, that's where we ended. Now, this set of errors, it doesn't fit squarely with any early heretical teachers mentioned by writers in the early church. In other words, you can't sit here and say, okay, we have these features and we know that fits snugly with the teaching of this guy or that guy. Okay, we can't quite plug it in like that. But in his commentary on the letters of John, uh, Colin Cruz, he says that you really can't improve on the conclusion of this German scholar, a fellow named Rudolf Schnackenberg. And he says, the heresy which occasioned first and second John cannot be parallel with any other manifestation of heresy known from that era. Yet it has affinities with more than one such movement. See, it, it picks up on the, on the intellectual climate, you see. He says, they all play down the historic person of Jesus Christ as the unique and true Savior. They all deny the way of salvation through his flesh and blood. In their precise Christological interpretation of the figure of Jesus, these dangerous heretics, dissolving as they did the substance of the Christian faith, evidently went off in different directions. So that's what, that's what you see in the second century. You see various plays of Gnosticism. You see Serenthus and you see other uh, versions where these ideas came to fruition in different directions in the second century. He continues, he says, this can be seen by comparing the views of Serenthus with those of the Docetists in the letters of Ignatius, whose precise teaching, however, remains obscure, the Christology of the Antichrist in the Johannine epistles also can no longer be described with certainty or precision, but it is one example of that pseudo-Christian tendency which manifested itself in Gnosticism and was such a threat to the church. Gnosticism was a heresy that was fought very hard in the second century in the church. So this is, this is what I think is going on. This is the context, the intellectual environment that gave rise to these false teachers. Now, in terms of the date, most of the scholars are convinced that 1 John was written after the Gospel of John, and most would date it to the last decade of the first century, like Carson and Moo, for example, date it to the early 90s. And part of the reason for that is that the errors of these false teachers, they fit in the intellectual climate of the late first century. So that's part of how they get there. And the ideas, you know, those ideas that wound up yielding that, that full-blown Gnosticism in the second century, they were loose and about and coming to prominence in the late first century. And many scholars think that, that misinterpretations of the Gospel of John was the root of some of these ideas. In other words, that, that somehow, so First John's after the Gospel of John, you have the Gospel of John probably written in the 80s, and you have misinterpretations of the Gospel of John that fueled these kinds of speculations where they took off on the Gospel of John in incorrect directions. We know that the Gnostics were attracted to the Gospel of John. They wrote the earliest commentaries on the Gospel of John. 
So they were fascinated with the gospel. And so perhaps that was the source of some of these things. They took the gospel of John, spun it off in some of these incorrect directions. In the late first century, these ideas were out there. You have these false teachers who rise from in the church, go out, and they're recruiting people to their heresy. And John writes this letter. All right, now we're getting to the text, okay? The prologue. He says, what was from the beginning... What we've, what we've heard, what we've seen with our eyes, what we looked at and our hands touched concerning the word of life, the life was manifested and we've seen it and we give testimony and proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us. What we've seen and we've heard we proclaim also to you so that you also may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. And we write these things so that our joy may be complete. Now, John's Greek normally is quite simple. Okay, when you're, when you're learning New Testament Greek, the first works they'll put you on will be like 1 John or maybe the first part of the Gospel of John or something like that. It's normally quite simple, but that's not true of these four verses. The Roman Catholic scholar Raymond Brown, he says in his commentary, the initial four verses of 1 John have a good claim to being the most complicated Greek in the Johannine corpus, in all of John's writings. These four verses are rather complicated in Greek, and many of the English translations, they smooth out the difficulties, essentially paraphrasing John's meaning. And I think those paraphrases are accurate. Okay, but I wanted to preserve for you a more literal reading so you can see more of what's going on. What I've rend- how I've rendered this here, it's closer to the American Standard Version, the New American Standard, or the English Standard Version. So I just wanted you to see some of the complexity that is here. Now, it should jump out at you that John is stressing firsthand personal association with the Lord Jesus. That should jump out at you. I mean, in verse 1, John refers to what they heard, what they saw, what they looked at, and what they touched concerning the word of life. In verse 2, he twice twice says the life was manifested and and says they saw it. And in verse 3, he again says what they saw and what they heard. Now, by my count, that's nine references to sense perception. So it it ought to jump out at you that John is really, he's stressing firsthand personal association with the Lord Jesus. And he does this, I'm convinced. He does this to assure his readers that in contrast to the false teachers, see what these guys are out peddling, his message, John's message, is the authentic, original message. You see, his message doesn't rest on lofty speculation or on philosophical insight into something. His message is based on first-hand knowledge, and that was important for the authority of the message. He's saying, I was there. You know, under these people over here, I'm telling you I was there. And it functions, I think, similarly to Galatians chapter 1 verses 11 and 12, where Paul says, For I declare to you, brothers, that the gospel that was preached by me is not according to man, for I neither received it from a man nor was taught it, but through revelation of Jesus Christ. I think it functions similarly to that. He's letting them know that, listen, this is the authentic, original message that was received through firsthand knowledge. And then he also, he uses, you see, he uses plural pronouns. You see that where we have we, our, and us. And I'm, the, the reason he does that, there's some disagreement about why he does that. I'm convinced the reason he does that is because he was one of a group of apostles. Those who were eyewitnesses to the life and teaching of Jesus. You see how they're referred to in, in Acts chapter 1, verses 21 and 22. See, he's declaring the one common apostolic message that was based on the one common message apostolic eyewitness experience. He's letting them know, what I'm giving you is the real deal. You can take what I'm saying to the bank. Now this phrase here, from the beginning, where he says in verse 1, the phrase from the beginning, it probably refers to the beginning of Jesus' ministry. 
and his first association with the disciples rather than to Christ's eternal existence. And you can see that usage like in the Gospel of John. I pulled out two verses here. He says, and you also will bear witness because you have been with me from the beginning. Okay, so he's talking about the beginning of what? His ministry and his association with him. 16.4, the Gospel of John. But I've said these things to you, that when their hour comes, you may remember that I told them to you. I did not say these things. I did not say these things to you from the beginning because I was with you. Okay, so I think he's using from the beginning. He means from the beginning of Jesus' ministry and his first association with the disciples. Now, John certainly believes in Christ's eternal existence, as shown by the next verse. I mean, that's not the question. He certainly believes in his eternal existence, but he's here, he's authenticating his teaching. He's authenticating his own teaching about Jesus in contrast to the message that the false teachers were out peddling. He's saying that the gospel that he preaches, that gospel is the foundational message that was both embodied by and preached by Jesus. It was embodied and preached by him. Jesus is both the preacher of God's message and the message itself. See, that's what he means when he says, in him God's message was both seen and heard. Because he is the embodiment of that message and he also is the preacher of God's message. And in verse 2, In verse 2, John affirms the incarnation. See, he affirms the fact that the eternal life that was with the Father was manifested in the historical person, Jesus of Nazareth. And he'll make that point several times throughout the letter. And that certainly echoes what you see in the Gospel of John chapter 1, right? Where it says the Word that was with God in the beginning, what? Became flesh. And dwelt among us. This is incarnation. You see, they came, the word that was eternal became flesh and dwelt among us. And that's what he's saying here in verse 2. Now, the incarnation. I mean, this is, I've mentioned many times, this is mind-blowing. You see, this is mind-blowing. The incarnation. This is something that's so profound and a, a profound truth. And it's one over which people have stumbled from John's day to the present. People are constantly resisting and even railing against the truth that Jesus is not simply a great man. He's not simply a great man. He's not like all of these other people. Well, we've got Jesus here and we've got, you know, Gandhi here and we've got... He's not like that. He's not simply a great man. He's God in the flesh. You see, that's an important thing. I think John Piper's uh, comments on this, I thought they were worth sharing with you. Piper says, many are willing to believe in Christ if he remains a merely spiritual reality. You see, there seems to be some distance with this. If he remains a mere, merely a spiritual reality. But when we preach that Christ has become a particular man in a particular place, issuing particular commands and dying on a particular cross, exposing the particular sins of our particular lives, then the preaching ceases to be acceptable for many. I don't think it's so much the mystery of a divine and human nature in one person that causes most people to stumble over the doctrine of the incarnation, although that is a mind blower. Okay, so let's not, let, let's not rush past that. That's, that's something that's heavy and deep. But he says he doesn't think that's what causes most people to stumble. He says the stumbling block is that if the doctrine is true, every single person in the world must obey this one particular Jewish man. Everything he says is law. Everything he did is perfect. And the particularity of his work and word flow out into history in the form of a particular inspired book written in particular languages of Greek and Hebrew that claims a universal authority over every other book that has ever been written. This is the stumbling block of the Incarnation. When God becomes a man, He strips away every pretense of man to be God. We can no longer do our own thing. We must do what this one Jewish man wants us to do. We can no longer pose as self-sufficient Because this one Jewish man says we're all sick with sin and must come to him for healing. 
we can no longer depend on our own wisdom to find light because this one Jewish man who lived for 30 obscure years in a little country in the Middle East says, I am the way and the truth and the life. When God becomes a man, man ceases to be the measure of all things and this man becomes the measure of all things. This is simply intolerable to the rebellious heart of men and women. The incarnation is a violation of the Bill of Human Rights written by Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. It's totalitarian. It's authoritarian, imperialism, despotism, usurpation, absolutism. Who does he think he is? God. God. That's who he thinks he is. That's who he is. You see, in that thing, no, we want to put him over here. Well, he was a good philosopher. He was this. He was like this guy. He's not like any of them. He's not like any of them. He is God in the flesh. Now, John says in verse 3, he says in verse 3 that the reason the apostles, as represented by John, the reason they proclaim to the, to the readers what they have seen and heard is so that the readers may have fellowship with them, may share in the spiritual bond of the family of God. That's why they're doing this. That's why they are proclaiming what they've seen and heard. Because that proclamation is instrumental to having fellowship with them being part of the spiritual bond of the family of God. If John's readers accept his proclamation of the original authentic message, that true message that's based on his firsthand knowledge, if they will accept that as opposed to the twisted message of the false teachers, well, they will remain or return to being his partners in the faith. If they don't accept his message, they will not have fellowship with the apostle. Now, that's important. You see, John's notion that fellowship is a product of accepting or abiding in the correct message about Jesus Christ, that is significant for the modern church. You see, that's significant. When John wanted to cultivate or preserve the fellowship of his readers, he got theological. In other words, he called people to fellowship in the truth. That's what he did. He didn't try to cultivate and preserve fellowship by reducing theology to its lowest common denominator by jettisoning every doctrine about which there's any disagreement. He didn't say because there's disagreement can we whittle Christian truth down to a bare essential and maybe we can find something that way we can agree on. He didn't approach it that way. You see, and there are those who use the noble desire of Christians for unity to push to ex for extending Christian fellowship to any person who utters the name Jesus. But there cannot be fellowship between persons who differ on central affirmations of faith. There can't be. Now, we can disagree and wrestle with what constitutes central affirmations of faith, but that's different from suggesting that no essential tenets of faith, there are none, and from criticizing every denial of fellowship as sectarian or exclusivist. John is telling us there is a truth about Jesus. There are essential things. And fellowship with God, fellowship with the apostles, being part of the spiritual family of God depends on consent to those truths. And so that's an important thing, I think, for the modern church to recognize. Let me read you a quote from a very well-known evangelical scholar. I mean, he's, he would be considered a, a monster theologian. I. Howard Marshall, he died in December of 2015, but he's a Methodist. I. Howard Marshall says, it is not true that there can be fellowship between persons who disagree on the central affirmations of faith. There cannot be unity between denominations which differ in their understanding of the way of salvation. And there cannot be unity between those who accept and those who do not accept Jesus Christ, crucified for our sins and raised for our justification as Savior. There is no common ground in such cases. Now, Norman Geisler, Geisler is a Baptist scholar. Geisler says in his book, The Battle for the Resurrection, he says, 
What about those who insist that drawing lines will divide Christians? In response, it must be lovingly but firmly maintained that it is better to be divided by truth than united by... Now, this is a Baptist. If I put up somebody from the Church of Christ that said this, everybody would be rolling their eyes. Oh, that's just Church of Christ people. They're just that way. But this is no secret. People can recognize that there are things beyond which you cannot go. Okay, and he says here, uh, better to be divided by truth than united by error. There is an unhealthy tendency in evangelical Christianity to hide under the banner of Christian charity while sacrificing doctrinal purity. While we must always manifest love toward those with whom we disagree, there is no necessity to sacrifice orthodoxy on the altar of unity. If push comes to shove, it's better to be divided by a true understanding of a fundamental truth than to be united on a false understanding of it. Otherwise, we'll be corrupted by compromise. And so here you see clearly we're dealing with something fundamental, this idea of the nature of Christ. Now, I say, what are essential things? What are fundamental things? We can wrestle with those, okay? But that's different than saying there is no fundamental thing. All we got to do is just get down to everybody that says the name Jesus. I don't care if they reject the nature of God. I don't care if they're polytheistic. I, none of that matters. Do they say the name Jesus? Well, these people said the name Jesus. But what do they mean by that? You see, and I think that's something that's uh, very important. All right, John makes clear. He makes clear that, uh, that his fellowship is with God. That he's reconciled to and in harmony with God and with God's Son, Jesus Christ. So he affirms implicitly the divinity of Jesus, and he implies that there cannot be a distinction between God the Father and Jesus the Son in the matter of fellowship. They are, of course, distinct persons of the Godhead, but in the matter of fellowship, you can't have one without the other. And he says that expressly in John 2, 1 John 2.23, no one who denies the Son has the Father. So I don't care how spiritual sounding they are, how many ohms they're going through, all of that kind of stuff. Anybody who denies the Son, who rejects who Jesus is, does not have the Father. You see, because they are like this. You don't deny one and have the other. And that's why Jesus says, of course, in John 14, 6, you see, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. You can't deny who he is and think that you have a role. Because, you know, look, God shows himself. Oh, there are all kinds of ways, all paths to God, many different religions. You see, and they all go, anybody who doesn't have the Son doesn't have the Father. Okay, now that's just, that's it. And so all the rest of the stuff is just talk. That's a bottom line truth. Now John says in verse 4, he says in verse 4 that his joy would be diminished if they should wander from the faith. That's what this is about. I write these things so that our joy may be complete. His joy, I see. I see. All right, John says in verse 4 that his joy would be diminished. You see, if they wander from the faith, if they wander out of salvation, and thus out of fellowship. Well, his joy is going to be diminished. And you see this in 3 John 3 and 4. He says, I was overjoyed when some of the brothers arrived and testified to your faithfulness in the truth. Namely, how you walk in the truth. I have no greater joy than this to hear that my children are walking in the truth. Now, you've had the experience in your life, I'm sure. Where you have had people you've known uh, years ago. Older I get now, I can say decades ago. You know, and then you hear from them, they pop up somewhere, they find you and contact you, and you hear that they're still serving faithfully. Oh, that's great. The downside is when you hear that they went off and became like Sikhs or this kind of thing. You know, but that's how John is, and that's why John says here what he wants. He's writing to make their joy complete so that they will not wander away out of salvation and out of fellowship. Because what delights John is to have people walking in the truth. All right, so this is like the prologue, John, in the first four verses of chapter 1. Now, in chapter 1, verse 5, through chapter 2, verse 6, John is going to give the message heard, and then he's going to elaborate on the implications of that message. He says, John 1, 5, and this is the message we've heard from him, 
and proclaim to you. So he's already talked about you know, how important this is, first-hand knowledge, what we've seen, what we've heard. This is the message we've heard from him and proclaim to you, that God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. This is the message we've heard from him and proclaim to you. See, John is proclaiming a message that he heard from the Lord Jesus. What he's about to announce is part of that authentic, original message to which he referred in the prologue, in, in the first four verses of chapter 1. And as such, it's an element. It's an element of the gospel which is essential for fellowship to exist. It's something fundamental, at least in concept, if not in precise formulation. This is something that is essential for us to grasp. And what is that message? Well, it's that God is light. And in Him, there is no darkness at all. John is using light here. He's using it primarily to symbolize God's holiness, His righteousness, His flawless perfection. And the comparison of good and evil with light and darkness, that's something that's well known in the ancient world. You can see, for example, in Isaiah 5.20, a classic example, where he says, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light, light for darkness. Okay, so you, you see how it's being used. It's being used with this moral sense. And so that's what John is doing there. You see places in the New Testament where light and darkness are used for a moral contrast. Include Romans 13, 11 to 14, Ephesians 5, 6 to 14. And there seems to be a moral element in the contrast in John chapter 11, verses 9 and 10. I think I. Howard Marshall is right when he says the contrast between God and darkness is expressed as strongly as possible. God is light, and in Him there is no darkness at all. You see, emphasizing that. And he says, I think it's as expressed as strongly as possible. The point is that living in the darkness is incompatible with fellowship with God. That makes it clear that the writer's thinking of light and darkness predominantly in ethical terms. It is his way of saying God is good and evil can have no place beside Him. You see, Leon Morris, he says, to say that God is light is to draw attention to his uprightness, his righteousness. Light is a natural symbol for attractive righteousness, just as darkness for the blackness of sin. So this is what John is on. And this message, or I think it'd be better to call it this axiom. You see, this message, this axiom, that God is light, and in Him there's no darkness at all, it forms the basis of what follows. He gives this message and then he is going to elaborate on the ethical implications of that axiom. God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. What does that then mean? And he'll elaborate on that in chapter 1 verse 6 through chapter 2 verse 6. But this is what we're teaching people, that God is light and in him there's no darkness at all. This is what we're teaching people in so many words when we tell them that their sin separates them from God. You see, that's, that's what we're teaching them in concept. Why does it separate them from God? Because God is light and in Him there is no darkness at all. His absolute atomic white purity is incompatible with sin. You see, you see how foundational that is? That's why John is saying, here's the message. We scratch our head and go, how's that message related to anything? Oh, it's very related. <laughs> It's foundational that God is absolutely just, righteous, holy. And there will be no fellowship. He has nothing to do. It's, he's incompatible with sin. Well, what are the implications of that message? All right, we get that in, the, in chapter 1, verses 6 through 10. All right, so he gives the message. Then he says, if we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness... We lie and do not do the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus his Son cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we do not have sin, 
we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just so that he forgives us the sins and cleanses us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. Okay, so John, he said, look, John says, if we say that we have fellowship with God, if we say that and walk in the darkness, we lie and do not do the truth. He says, if we do that, if we say we have fellowship with God, we're reconciled with him and we walk in the darkness, we are lying. He's refuting the false teacher's claims. They claim to have fellowship with God. They claim to have fellowship with him, but they were in fact what? Walking in darkness. You see, they were walking in darkness. It shows that the, the fact they were doing that shows that their claim to have fellowship with God is what? It's a lie. Right there out telling everybody, oh no, we're, we're right with God. We're right with God. We've got this deeper, greater understanding. We've transcended. We've left them behind. They're like, you know, uh, just old dummies or whatever. And so we have fellowship with God, but the fact they walk in the darkness shows that their claim to have fellowship with God is a lie. These people had fooled themselves into thinking that they were right with God when in fact they were not. Can people do that? Or do we have to say every time somebody says, no, I'm right with God. I know I'm right with God. Well, there are objective truths. They would have said we're right with God. That was part of their appeal. But they weren't. And the fact they walked in the darkness showed conclusively that they were wrong. That they were lying in the claim they made to be with God. Now, walking is a well-known Jewish metaphor for how one lives. It's a well-known metaphor. In fact, the standard Greek lexicon one of the words, one of the definitions it gives for this word, peripateo, is to conduct one's life. That's what it means, to conduct one's life. See, to walk in darkness is, a, is to conduct one's life without awareness of or regard for the will of God. It is to live in sin. That's what walking in the darkness is. It is to live in sin. That's why he says that those who walk in darkness do not do, they don't do the truth. That's the same expression that he uses in the Gospel of John, chapter 3, verse 21, where it clearly means the opposite of doing evil. Doing the truth is the opposite of doing evil. These people do not do the truth. And you see Colin Cruz comments, he says, the phrase, does the truth, in John 3.21 suggests that here in 1 John, doing the truth means living in the light of the truth and seeking to avoid sin. It is not enough to claim to know God as the secessionists did. People also must live in the light of that truth, putting it into practice and avoiding sin. Is that the first bell? Good. <laughs> All right, putting it into practice and avoiding sin. You see, that's, that's, what is, that's what is being, this idea that walking in the darkness involves living in sin. You see, living in sin, it's confirmed by 1 John chapter 2, verse 11, where it says, but the one who hates his brother is in darkness, walks in the darkness. Look at what's walking in the darkness. It's this idea of living in sin. The one who hates his brother. As John would appeal to these people who have seceded and who are not showing any love to the faithful community, he says, that's proof that they're not of the truth, you see. And so here they are. You see the ethical connotation of this idea of walking in the light. It is this idea of how one conducts and lives. He says, the one who hates his brothers in darkness, walks in the darkness, does not know where he's going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. Now, as, as I indicated, these false teachers... They had constructed a theology, a system, by which they negated the reality or the significance of their sin. You see, I gave you an idea how that could happen in light of the intellectual environment or the climate of the late first century. This radical dualism. Whether it was that way or some other way, they clearly had constructed a theological system 
by which they negated the reality or the significance of their sin. Now, whatever they were telling themselves, they in fact were living in sin. They were walking in darkness, and since that is incompatible with the character of God as light, their claim to be in fellowship with God while living in sin was a lie. That's what he's letting them know. John says the same thing, much the same thing. In chapter 2, verse 4, he says, The one who says, I've come to know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar. Oh, no, no, God and I are fine. I'm over here living any way I want. I'm ignoring how God calls me to live, because whether it's for this reason or some other, because I don't think what I do with my mortal body, who cares? This is all just dross junk. It's going to be all done away with. This doesn't matter. And he says here, one who says, I've come to know him and doesn't keep his commandments is a liar. In this one, the truth is not. And I think this is an important message. It's an important message for us to have. John's making the same point as I read this. He's making the same point that Jesus made in Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 and 23. Jesus said, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Now, whatever you think, whatever you're going to do with this, you have to recognize some connection between your surrender and your life and how you live and your relationship with God. You cannot simply say, I live any way I want, but I believe in Jesus. You see, if you say that, you don't know what believe in Jesus means. All right, he says, on that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do mighty works in your name? And then I will declare that I never knew you depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Does that mean he's talking about anybody who sins? No, he's talking about the people who are walking in darkness. The people whose lives are characterized by a rejection of lordship. They are going to take their, whether it's John's people, who sit here and say, we're going to live the way we want to live. That's what we're going to do. We're going to just go ahead and live how we want to. Then he says in, he says in, in verse 7, But if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Now, I don't know a greater promise, because you and I, we all continue to sin. Okay? We all continue to sin, but what is this promise? That a person sins while walking in the light. You see, so the, but what does that mean? See, the person whose life is characterized by a submission to the Lord Jesus, who then in that submission fails and sins and stumbles, that is completely different from somebody who rejects submission to Jesus, from somebody who says, listen, I don't care what he wants. I'm going to live the way I want. Do you see the difference between that and the person who focuses on him, accepts his lordship, tries to live to glorify him, and who fails in that endeavor? That's different from the person I've used the example of kids. You know, it's different from the kid who's trying and failing and trying and failing. When he fails, he says, you know, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to, or, you know, I shouldn't have done that. Or, and then the kid who says, Pfft, Right? I mean, there's a difference there. And that's the difference. And the person, see, who is failing in a general submission to Christ has peace because the blood of his son continues to cleanse us. And see, that is the greatest. Because all of our failures, we're not spiritual neurotics. We care about obedience. We care about living to the glory of God. But we're not neurotic about it. Because why? Because we know that as we focus on Jesus and walk in his direction, our failures and sins, his blood just continues to cleanse us. And there's no greater thing than that. No greater thing. Thanks for coming. I heard that back.